Yeah. Um, uh, before I start, uh, I just want to say sorry. I think I smuggled a typo into the program. Uh, there it says causal clams. Uh, of course, this should have said uh, casual clams. Um, so it's really all about whether <laughs> clams that are tasty in one place are also tasty in another. Okay. So I can see you're chuckling behind your screens. That's good. Um, all right, let's get started. So evidential pluralism and extrapolation of, of causal claims, of course. Uh, so here's a bit of an outline. So I'm interested in evidence-based policy, which as some of you might be familiar with is the idea that we should use high quality uh, evidence, especially from randomized controlled trials to inform policy making decisions. So it's really all about learning what works and then implementing those interventions that are effective. Okay. And in this context, my focus is on how to extrapolate policy effects uh, to novel target populations. So in evidence-based policy, there is very often the suspicion that the study populations where we test interventions and the eventual targets that we're interested in are causally relevantly different. So whatever works in one place is not guaranteed at least to work in another place. Okay. Now what I'm gonna argue today is that first, Many extrapolations performed in evidence-based policy are unlikely to be successful using standard kinds of evidence preferred in this field, notably quantitative observational evidence. Instead, these extrapolations actually require integrating quantitative and qualitative evidence. And I'm gonna expand on how exactly that might go down. And I'll emphasize that this integration is ampliative. It enables conclusions that wouldn't be accessible from either type of evidence alone. So this is really two different kinds of evidence coming together and working in this ampliative, ampliative way. Okay, and I'll, I, I hope to be able to make two contributions here really. So one is to provide a relatively broad social science test case. So it's about extrapolation quite generally, at least in evidence-based policy, where evidential pluralism isn't just fruitful, but indeed essential uh, to achieve our epistemic aims. And second, I wanna flag some quite important challenges that I see remaining. Namely, most importantly, the challenge of how can we elaborate the benefits of evidential pluralism in a non-trivial way? So rather than just pointing out, oh, you know, here's a case where it seems to work and there is a case where it doesn't seem to work, uh, to try and build sort of like a mid-level uh, theory that can take context on board in telling us before the fact when to expect being pluralist about the kinds of evidence we employ mm -hmm. is going to work in our favor. Sorry? Okay. All right, let me say a few things on extrapolation real quick. Um, so first, there is this obvious worry, okay? It's that causally relevant differences between populations are ubiquitous. Just because something works in one place, it's not guaranteed to work in another. But then there is also a hope, right? So at least in principle, if we had all the information about similarities and differences between population, that information can be used to successfully extrapolate despite any differences. So the idea is that if we can somehow factor in how any differences between populations bear on the ultimate effects of interest, then we can still predict these effects correctly despite differences. Okay. And then finally, I wanna emphasize that mechanisms obviously matter in this whole thing. So some of the relevant similarities and differences concern those at the level of causal mechanisms. Now that means that one of the main problems that we're facing in extrapolation is how to clarify whether the causal mechanisms in a study population A and in a target B are sufficiently similar. Okay. So what I'll assume in the following uh, is first, somewhat generously, that we have a good grasp of the mechanism in the experimental population. And this is very obviously just not the case in, in, in many real world extrapolations, but it makes uh, my arguments a bit more uh, a bit, bit more accessible because we, we, we don't need to worry about all this uh, upstream work that needs to be done in order to get that grasp. I'll just assume that we have that good grasp of the mechanism in the experiment. But I'll also assume that theory is rarely gonna be a good guide to a target's mechanism. So in social sciences, we rarely encounter cases where we have strong enough theory that tells us something like, well, in this population, you're entitled to expect this type of mechanism, whereas in this other population, you know, there are go going to be th these important deviations from that template and so forth, okay? So that means that we somehow need to get an empirical handle uh, on the target's mechanism. And the question is, how do we do that exactly? So one idea is to simply use quantitative observational data from the target to speak to these issues of clarifying similarities and differences between populations. So how could that work? 
Well, one proposal here is to use comparative process tracing. Okay, I'll just give a very brief sketch of how that could work under very ideal circumstances. So the idea here is that this mechanistic knowledge from an experiment, which I'll just assume exists, can help us specify what would be characteristic marks or symptoms or fingerprints, as Derek called them yesterday, of a, of a certain mechanism being operational, namely the one that we somehow learned about from the experiment. So ideally characteristic, of course, means that only the mechanism of interest produces the mark or symptom or fingerprint in question. Think sort of smoking gun evidence. If you see the smoke, you know that a gun or indeed a particular gun has been fired. And then if we proceed and find these marks or symptoms of fingerprints in a target, then we can assert that the mechanism of the target is similar to that in the experiment. And we're pretty much done. Okay, so hugely simplified, of course, but this is you know, roughly how that could work. Okay. So let me provide a, a toy example to illustrate how that could work or could not work indeed in practice. And this is gonna bring uh, the main concerns that I'm focused on here. Okay. So let's assume that we have uh, evidence from an RCT indicating that distributing insecticide treated bed nets is, uh, which I'm gonna call X, is effective at decreasing malaria infection rates uh, called Y in population range. And now our extrapolative query is just gonna be, well, what's the effect of distributing bed nets in a novel target B, a target that might differ in causally important ways. So let's assume again that we have knowledge of the mechanism in the experimental population and that it looks as follows. So it's a single path mediated mechanism from X over Z to Y. So X is just the number of distributed nets. Z is the number of properly installed nets and Y is the malaria infection outcome. Massively simplified, of course. But the idea is that X should ideally be positively relevant for Z. So we distribute nets and hope that they will actually be properly installed. And then properly installed nets should be negatively relevant for the malaria infection outcome. Okay. Now, what could be potential differences in mechanisms that we might need to worry about in a target B? These could be, for instance, that nets are going to be misused in the target. So we distribute nets, but people don't use them as, fish, uh, don't use them as bed nets, but as fishing nets, for instance that would put pressure on the XZ error, okay? Similarly, agents could just fail to properly install the nets. So they install the nets and in, say in the sense of hanging them on the ceiling, but don't let them unfold properly to establish a barrier between uh, the site of sleep and the mosquitoes that are buzzing around. And then finally, the insecticide could fail, for instance. So for some reason, it could be that the mosquitoes that we're facing at the target are just not especially bothered by the insecticide that the nets are treated with. Okay, so that would put pressure on the error between Z and Y. Now, how can we rule out these potential differences that might arise in B? So some of the characteristic marks or symptoms of the mechanism M1 from the experiment that we might be wanting to look out for in the target could be the following. So for instance, we could use observational data to see whether Z is higher conditional in X than unconditional, uh, uh, unconditionally. So that would suggest that indeed agents managed to successfully install the distributed nets and that this relationship is not severed in the target. Similarly, we could uh, look at whether we find that Y is lower conditional in Z than unconditionally, suggesting that indeed properly installed nets curtail malaria infection. Or we could look for things like dead mosquitoes next to properly installed nets, indicating that the insecticidal effects of the nets indeed uh, uh, obtained in the target. But there are two problems with this strategy. The first is that if nets have never been introduced in the target, meaning that X just equals zero for all individuals and consequently Z does so as well, then observational data just won't exhibit any of the characteristic marks or symptoms that we might be interested in looking for. And that's the case even if the mechanisms are indeed identical, which is something that we might hope for. But there is a second more pernicious problem and it's, uh, it's, it's called the extrapolator circle. Uh, and that problem is that, well, there, there is one really easy way to remedy the situation. It's by just going to the target and distributing it there and seeing what happens. So this is a pretty surefire way of, of clarifying whether these causal relationships are instantiated there. But doing that just trivializes your inference, right? So if what you need to do in order to clarify whether mechanisms are similar is to implement the intervention of interest, then you can already learn all the relationships and effects that you're interested in based on you know, 
doing that alone and you don't need any information from, from an experiment anymore. So you make that information redundant essentially. Uh, or you might even say that you stop extrapolating altogether. So this is something to be avoided. Okay. Now here are some takeaways from this example. So the general concern seems to be that quantitative observational data from a target often just don't contain distinctive marks or symptoms that we might uh, be wanting to use to underwrite an extrapolation. And that's especially pertinent if a target's mechanism hasn't been active, so to speak. So there's just insufficient variation that has some bearing on the causal questions that we need to clarify. In these cases, comparative process tracing and similar empirical strategies simply lack the information that they need to function properly. So we need other kinds of evidence to clarify mechanistic similarities and difference. Okay, so what's that alternative? Well, here it is. It's qualitative evidence to the rescue, as you might have uh, anticipated. So the idea here is that we use qualitative evidence produced, for instance, by interviews, participatory observations, and so forth, um, to, to elicit some information, at least, with bearing on questions about mechanisms. Okay? So for instance, we could survey agents how they would respond to hypothetical interventions, asking them, for instance, well, if I were to give you this mosquito net here, what would you think that you uh, would going to be uh, doing with it? Would you use it as a fishing net or indeed, you know, install it properly, blah, blah, blah. Or we could ask them how they think that others would respond. Or we could observe local practices from a distance, so to speak, and theorize how these might interact with an intervention of interest. Now, importantly, the, the main idea here is that agents, at least in the first two cases where we survey them, can, agents can at least sometimes simulate interventions in their minds and report on features on a mechanism uh, by doing so. And this is especially promising, I think, in cases where the relevant parts of a mechanism are mediated by agents' own decision-making. So think about the bed net case again, but what happens between distributing the net and the net becoming properly installed is really down to what agents decide to do with the bed. And this might indeed be something that, at least under some conditions, agents can successfully anticipate before the fact. Now, what's important about this strategy is that our inference is not trivialized by it. So it's one thing to go to the target and ask agents what they think they would be doing if subjected to a certain kind of intervention. And this might, under helpful conditions, be a good guide to what is going to happen, but it's not the same as actually implementing the intervention there. So we don't trivialize our inference. Of course, it's also important uh, to notice that pertinent methodological concerns are going to arise here. So these reports made by agents might just be very unreliable or agents might strategically misreport. So they would tell you that, of course, I'm going to install that as a mosquito net uh, because they know that if it, they, they told you that they were going to use it as a fishing net, they just simply wouldn't get the net in the first place. Okay. But social scientists have ways to respond to these concerns, which I'm not going to go into here. So let's just grant that for the second. Okay. So the upshot anyway should be that using qualitative evidence to support extrapolation can work well in some cases, okay? But it's not a silver bullet. So let me provide a slightly more worrying example. So this is about HIV prevention. And let's suppose that we have this sexual behavior change intervention called SBC, which aims to decrease the HIV infection rate in a population. So what SBC does is it offers counseling to promote agents' understanding of HIV transmission and of condom functioning. So what kind of functional role condoms play in curtailing HIV transmission. Okay. So let's assume that SPC has been demonstrated to be effective in a range of populations, but so far no type A individuals have been represented in our trials. Type A individuals are distinguished as follows. First, they face high baseline risk of HIV infection. Second, they have little or no previous experience in using condoms. Third, they have little understanding of HIV transmission and condom functioning. All of these make them very interesting targets for the intervention, in fact. And then fourth, they might also differ in causally important ways from the agents so far examined. So for instance, they might have religious convictions against condom use or something like that. Okay. Now again, the question here is, how can we ensure the SPC will work for them? Okay. In line with what I said earlier, our aim in this extrapolation is really to clarify whether the mechanisms uh, are sufficiently similar in type A individuals as in trial populations. 
And again, I'm going to conveniently assume that we have a good grasp of the mechanism in the trial populations. So let's just assume it looks like this. I'll just walk you through it uh, really quickly. So it's a single path mediated mechanism. Again, super simplistic. On the left, we have the intervention, whether agents are exposed to SPC. And that intervention is supposed to promote their understanding of HIV transmission and condom function. And this understanding, in turn, is supposed to promote their intent to use condoms. Okay. And this is supposed to promote actual condom use. Right. So granting, obviously, that some background conditions are satisfied, for instance, that condoms are indeed available, intent to use condoms is supposed to translate into actual condom use, which then in turn, of course, is supposed to curtail HIV infection. Okay. Now, of course, in underwriting and extrapolation, we must ensure that we have support for all of these individual causal relationships to be instantiated in the target. But I'll just focus on one of them, the one between understanding and intent, this one. Okay, so it's a question of whether increased HIV transmission and condom functioning understanding will indeed translate into increased intent to use condoms in the target. Now, following the strategy that I outlined earlier, what we could do here is to ask agents whether their intent to use condoms would increase if they were better informed about HIV transmission. But I'm assuming that you already see the problem with this here, which is that Doing that is just not very illuminating if agents lack the very understanding of HIV transmission and condom functioning that the intervention seeks to induce. So if you're not already aware of the significant health risk that HIV uh, infection might pose to you and how for these reasons it might, be it might be desirable to prevent infection, what role condoms play functionally in preventing infection and so on and so forth, then it's really hard to predict how being exposed to this intervention or how having this hypothetically increased understanding would bear on your intent to use condoms, which is something that anyway you're not especially familiar with. So generally the concern is that when agents are unfamiliar with the changes that an intervention is supposed to induce, it's just very difficult for them to reliably predict their own or indeed other people's behaviors. Okay. So here are some takeaways from the, from the two examples that I've just walked you through. So first, Quantitative observational evidence is very often a poor guide to clarifying similarities and differences in mechanisms between populations. And that's especially the case when interventions are novel and the target's mechanism hasn't been appropriately active, so to speak, to write distinctive marks or symptoms or fingerprints into quantitative observational data. In these cases, it seems that quantitative and qualitative evidence can be important complements in facilitating extrapolation. So here's how that works. So again, quantitative evidence supplies effect sizes from a study population. So we learn what to expect in the target if mechanisms were similar, but it doesn't really help us tell whether populations are indeed similar. Okay, so this is what we need other kinds of evidence for. And then qualitative evidence comes in, which can clarify these similarities and differences between populations, but it couldn't on its own tell us what effects to expect in a target especially in terms of the magnitude of these effects. Okay. So integrating these two kinds of evidence, I argue, can be ampliated. It enables conclusions that simply wouldn't be accessible from either type of evidence alone. And this, I think, makes a strong case for evidential pluralism uh, in facilitating extrapolation in evidence-based policy. Okay, <clears throat> let me finish by saying something on what I consider to be important remaining challenges. And this is something that I'm really quite dissatisfied with because I, I hope to be able to make much more progress uh, in, the, in the previous months in making more positive proposals at this stage. But I, I realized that doing that is actually really quite hard. So I really just wanna kind of outline uh, what sort of work I think I should be doing anyway and I hope also others agree would be interesting uh, to do in the future. Okay, so Recognizing that and also how integrating evidence benefits extrapolation, but also other kinds of uh, inferences is of course useful. But we need to do much better than just stopping at these unilluminating platitudes that you find, you know, sometimes for instance, in the, in the kind of mixed methods leaning literature out there where people say things like, oh, evidence integration is beneficial whenever the distinctive strengths of one kind of evidence countervail the weaknesses of another. And 
I don't really like take much issue with that. I mean, you know, that seems perfectly all right with me. Um, indeed, it entirely conforms to my intuitions about what, what's going on in the cases that I've been thinking about. But it's just not very illuminating. We also need to grasp the extension of these benefits, right? So we need to be able to tell when this is likely to, to be the case and when not. Okay. So for instance, as I've argued, when interventions are novel and poorly understood, then neither quantitative nor qualitative evidence will be especially helpful, such as in the SBC case. Okay. So the crucial question really seems to be, how can we tell before the fact, say for instance, before engaging in a particular inference, whether evidence integration will help us, what evidence to seek out and how to integrate it. So what's needed here, I think, is more systematic investigation of how context bears on how different kinds of evidence can gel together in beneficial ways. So think again about the difference between the bednet case and the HIV case. So these are very similar, but one seems more promisingly to be addressed by using uh, evidence integration and the other really doesn't. And the difference, or one of the main differences seems to be the extent to which people, uh, agents in the target understand, uh, you know, th the mechanisms that they're a part of, embedded them and so forth, and also the intervention that's at issue. So this is clearly contextual. Okay. Now my hope is that more case study work, uh, actual case study work, instead of just a, you know, imaginary case study work that I've been trying to do here, uh, can help us First, facilitate better understanding of which combinations of evidence work for which kinds of cases and why. And there is obviously a rich literature, rich, rich mixed methods literature out there uh, that delivers plenty of cases that we might just simply look at and think about. And then such case study work ultimately, uh, I hope, is also uh, going to be helpful uh, in, in, uh, for, for, for building general but still context sensitive recipes for evidence integration that can guide practice. So this is really sort of an invitation, uh, a slightly depressing one because I, I would have liked myself to be uh, able to uh, present work of that kind already uh, having been done at this stage, but it's more of an invitation to, to people here at this conference who are obviously interested in the, in the, in the theme of, of pluralism uh, to engage in this, Type of work because I consider it to be uh, quite promising and what we should do in the future. Okay, so this is it for me. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to take questions now. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Donald. So uh, any questions from the audience? Julian, did you have a question there? Uh, let me see. Let me. Uh, so, Roberto first. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Julian? Sorry, I got the order wrong. Roberto. Okay, good. So, I'll be quick. Uh, um, Donald, uh, just a couple of quick questions. The first, uh, what do you advise to do when uh, qualitative and quantitative evidence actually diverge or contradict each other? Don't we need, at the end of the day, some kind of background theory, which seems to be run a bit against what you were uh, seemingly suggesting at the beginning? And secondly, uh, what account of similarity would you advise to use when it comes to assessing the similarity of mechanism? Thank you. Feel free to drown previous work. <laughs> right. uh, great. These are good. Um, very incisive, indeed. Okay, so about the contradiction bit, well, I don't really see how that could happen because um, when qualitative and quantitative evidence come together in the way that I sketched out, it's really that they're complementary. So they, they solve entirely different questions. So one is really just to supply effect sizes, you know, again, telling us you know, what would happen in the target if populations were similar, but then that is a, a separate question entirely to be addressed by drawing on qualitative evidence. So it's really hard to see how they could even contradict in the first place. So I'm not, I mean, unless you have a concrete example, maybe I'm not seeing something here, but okay, I don't really think that that's a pressing problem. Uh, as for the kind of similarity, um, I mean, that's a tough one, as you know, uh, because I, I've had my own quarrels uh, with uh, coming to terms uh, with the general question of whether, you know, we can even have you know, an informative account of, of what's 